In this video, we're trying something new. We're starting a video series where I travel the world to see cool technology, meet interesting people, and try new things. On this episode, we're going to the home of Red Bull Racing to see the reveal of the RB20. F1 popularity has exploded in recent years, making it one of the biggest engineering-driven sports in the world. Combining insane talent with bleeding-edge technology to race at speeds in excess of 300 kilometers per hour. My first exposure to F1, funny enough, was Iron Man 2, when Tony casually asks to drive Stark Industries' F1 car in Monaco. In hindsight, this might be one of the most ridiculous parts of the entire movie. Imagine billionaire Lawrence Strahl driving his F1 team's car. Yeah, that's not happening. Red Bull Racing has been around since 2005, a team owned by an energy drink company, a team no one expected to succeed. Last year, the RB19 won every single race except for one, breaking almost every F1 record out there. And today, I get to be one of the first people to see the RB20. And the question we're all wondering, will it live up to its predecessor? Will they be unstoppable? MK7 is the hub of Red Bull Racing. It's where they engineer, design, and build those amazing cars that you see on TV. When Red Bull Canada invited me to this event, I knew I had to take Jose. Jose is one of my younger employees, and he is a diehard Max Verstappen fan. Want to see the RB20 reveal? Oh yeah. I need your passport. I don't know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> so they've got almost every Red Bull F1 car here. The one that's missing is the RB8, which we saw yesterday at a secret event, but more on that later. It's amazing how much history they have right here. We, we put a car on a shelf. We had the Cybertruck on the shelf. Basically, Basically the same thing. I love the projecting on the fabric. It's kind of see through. It's giving me ideas for future Hacksmith project reveals. Now we are getting closer to that big reveal of the RB20, but before we do that, great if you could take us back to the drawing board. What's the changes for this year's car? You have to keep pushing. We've made some improvements to the car in all areas, um, mechanical, vehicle dynamics and aerodynamics. Is that enough? Who knows? We shall have to see. And now we've made it to that moment that we've all been waiting for, the big reveal. It's your first sight of a car that's going to be making fresh Red Bull history. So get ready for this. It's time to meet the RB20. <laughs> RB20. I want one. It's only $120 million. Is that the estimate it cost? Like the, the whole budget for each oh. team is $120 million. The, the greatest thing would be to have a, the perfect season, which they almost got last year. But considering how successful that car is, I'm not really sure where things are going to go. And that's part of the fun of F1. You never know what's going to happen. But, yeah, me and Max yeah. were chatting earlier and like, yeah. they're going to dominate. Yeah, we just chilling with them, you know? We had breakfast <laughs> with Checo, you know? Yeah, yeah. Where was I? <laughs> <laughs> VIPs only, Darren. Oh, yeah. To the average non-F1 fan, I would say uh, same, same, but different. And to the <laughs> die-hard fans, is it same, like same, Jose. different? Mm, it's completely different. <laughs> completely different. There's so many changes. The most important change is probably the side pods. Mercedes tried a concept called the Zero Pod concept, but Mercedes didn't quite get it right, so they basically just backtracked the design. But this year, Red Bull who is trying now to attempt the zero pod design. So Adrian Nui being the genius that he is, it seems like he's actually making it work. As a Red Bull ambassador, Red Bull Canada got me an interview with one of the chief engineers of Red Bull Racing. And we got to chat a bit about what's it like to design some of the fastest machines in the world. Paul, really appreciate meeting you, taking some nice time out of your day. I know you're really busy with the clock is ticking. <laughs> the race is coming. <laughs> and one of the main questions I think my audience would like to know is just how involved are the drivers in the design process? If, if you take the design process as a, as a constantly evolving challenge, you know, we, don't, we don't build a car for race one and it's the same at race five, ten, etc. through the season, then that it's, it's a continual process. Yep. After every session we have a debrief. Things may change as a consequence of that. The scale of change is linked to 
the resource we want to put against something and how long it will take us to realise it. Right. So if you say to you, disregard the scale of any change, then after every debrief the car changes. And the tyre changes as a consequence of the driver's feedback as well right. as what we see in the data. Now if there are more fundamentals that we need to change and evolve, then we've got to do some research to figure out if we can identify what the driver is commenting upon or what we see in the data, a combination of the two. How do we then go about fixing it? And then do we, how do we realize the change onto the car? It's an eternal and rolling process. At what point do you decide to change direction? Obviously, you could go down the rabbit hole in one area of the car, who kind of actually makes that final call of like, okay, we've gone far enough this way, well, this is more important than that, that applies. <laughs> that applies on, on a session by session basis as well as a, um, a longer term basis. So, okay, try to think of an example. Uh, okay, rear wing level. Okay. You could say, right, we are gonna run I don't know, a high downforce package at a certain circuit. We know the pitfalls, we know the gains and we perceive the gains as being greater than the pitfalls. So you say, okay, well, when you say change of direction, we've gone down a rabbit hole. If we want to change rear wing level, but we're not going to do it in session, but between sessions, you could say, right, actually, we're going to change the aerodynamic configuration of the car. We're going to change the amount of lift we want to make for a certain speed and therefore the drag at that certain speed. So we can put a lower level of rear wing on it. We can put more rear wing onto the car. Small changes of that scale, if you took that as being a direction, we can bail out of pretty quickly. Longer term ones tend to require a lot more research to understand what has necessarily not performed to, as we would expect. We don't design ourselves into a rabbit hole, but if the realization is that we may be approaching some limits we didn't foresee, then your research has got to find it before you can get out of it. Right. Otherwise you're guessing. Yeah. You, know, you guess, you just unravel that. You? It's the scale of the problem and the understanding of the problem before you can apply a solution. Teams do it all the time. You can change direction, you're allowed. <laughs> There's no rules against it it becomes a question of can you achieve it in, in the year? Do you, what scale of change do you need to make? Now we have the budget cap. Some of it is from financially, can we actually realize it? Or then do we have to consider it into the following year and how much of the car do we have to carve up? So actually with, with that in mind, with the upcoming rule changes in 2026, how soon do you start working on? It's already on it, yeah. never be. Yeah. Um, the amount of work is linked to the amount of knowledge we have of the car. So there's some fundamental research going on. I have to get the engines well underway. Which is very the exciting with the Red Bull engine Optimism, coming out. Yes, isn't it? Wonderful. You've been over there. <laughs> uh, no, that okay. was not part Don't of the tour. Don't take them, they're not allowed. But, uh, <laughs> it's, an, uh, it's a wonderful research facility and they'll, they'll do some stunning work. I'm Incredible. Sure. Yeah, if we don't start now, then we'll be miles behind. I tend to work some pretty crazy hours when I'm obsessed with something. How crazy is the overtime? If I say to you that it's the job as and hours as, as are required to fulfill the role, then it becomes similar to your projects. Track side, there are curfew hours, but it doesn't stop research here. It doesn't stop other work continuing. At the beginning of the year, it's not going to be a cruise, is it? You've got a new car, the changes, the understanding, realizing it is, can we actually put it down the ground in Bahrain and be able to run? That requires a lot of effort from a lot of people. And don't forget, we've got to have in, what, about 10 days, two cars plus spares and then hit the ground running in Bahrain. And then we're a week later, we're in Jeddah, with whatever we've got left from Bahrain, and we've got to be up and running again. I assume definitely an engineer's dream job, so I was wondering if you have any words of advice for young students who are in the STEM fields and might be wanting to pursue a career in something like this. Well, as you kind of highlighted, it's not nine to five, so be prepared <laughs> for the demands it places upon you. If you're committed enough and want to do it, keep your head down, work hard, broaden your interest, because you never know what level or what type of engineering you can end up doing. Yep. It's a great privilege to work on these cars because they're yeah, prototypes, they're constantly changing, it's never a fixed specification mm -hmm. and the challenge evolves on a uh, week by week uh, basis. Every, uh, well, we've got 24 very public exams coming up, haven't we? Yep. <laughs> when we look like idiots or we look like genii. Um, so be prepared for that, but it's, um, it's a wonderful sport in that we change things. And as engineers here we are in a frontline sport influencing something. Definitely. So uh, it's a privilege and uh, very occasionally you have to pinch yourself and remind yourself <laughs> when the hours are getting a bit long. That's awesome. So well, there we go. Pleasure. Thanks pleasure. so much. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. I like it. We're looking at what I'm assuming is the shop where they maintain the show cars. They just keep them alive, you know, keep them running. And a couple of supercars that are basically Formula One cars for the road. Yeah, those. Oh. Yeah. These are like, I think, uh, like three, four million dollars. Oh, that's a lot. I think so. I'm not oh. sure. I see toolboxes, but I, I have to wonder, like, does any actual work happen here? Is this just all for show? Something cool back there, but I don't know if we're supposed to go in there. 
Oh, oh, Holy. Okay, hey, continue. Does the team get one and the driver get one? Or uh, the driver the ones here? No, that means it's the same race. Different year. Or oh. the, uh, different positions, too. For the rest of the tour, unfortunately, we weren't allowed to take a camera in, but I can tell you a bit about some of the cool stuff that we saw. Now, they don't actually use emails here at Red Bull. In fact, the engineering department sends these pink envelopes down to communicate design changes. This is both for security and to ensure that those design changes are followed exactly. The next stop on the tour was the command center, co-designed with NASA. It quite literally looked like you could monitor rockets going to space from here. Over 60 people work out of this facility during the races, live streamed from wherever they're racing. Next stop was my favorite part of the tour, the machine shop. They have massive DMG Mori CNC machines, which are kind of like the Rolls Royce of CNC machines. After that, we saw room-sized autoclaves. We've actually got a autoclave ourselves in our clean room at Hacksmith Industries, but it's the size of a microwave. The final stop on our tour was the Red Bull cafeteria, and I can tell you, they eat damn well. All right, that tour was incredible. If you have a chance to check out MK7, highly recommend it. Now, that wasn't all Red Bull had in store for us. They asked if we wanted to see something new. And when Red Bull asks you if you want to see something new, you say yes, you know it's going to be amazing. Now, before we get to that, I wanted to thank you guys. Last year, we launched our very first product that's completely designed in-house here at Herc, the Mini Saber. It's a butane lighter that looks like a small lightsaber. And we have color changers to change the flame from blue to red and even green, and we're working on purple and yellow next. Now, demand for these has been incredible and it's been amazing. I can't thank you guys enough. We've had a really hard time keeping them in stock, but we've gone ahead and we've ordered something like 10,000 more of them, which will be arriving next month. So if you guys want to get a mini saber, if you pre-order one right now, the link is in the description below, you'll get a free 10 pack of color changers, either red or green. So if you want to help support Hacksmith Industries and all these crazy projects we do, check out Hacksmith.store. Thanks guys. All right, we're here at Millbrook Proving Grounds, which is this crazy track in England. They've got the RB8 and they're unveiling a drone capable of following an F1 car around the track at speeds of up to 350 kilometers per hour. Crazy. Red Bull is trying to revolutionize the way we watch Formula One. Today, I get to see the drone in action and we get to talk exclusively with the brains behind this year long project. It's Ralph, he calls himself Shaggy, so he's the master pilot. Like we started at drone racing, like competition racing, and there you learn how to fly manually controlled drones, so the drone's not doing anything for you, no GPS, no stabilization, doesn't know what's up and down, but controlling the drone with the goggles on. But it's, it's even a little bit more harder to fly because it's like a rocket shape, so normally you take off, you fly like this, and then you steer it, but this, when you go over 120 kilometers an hour, it's basically changes into like more of an airplane, and, and it's very sensitive on, on Controls. The acceleration and top speed numbers. Top speed is about 350 kilometers an hour. <laughs> uh, so we have some margin usually over most Formula One tracks. Uh, acceleration zero to like 100 kilometers an hour, not sure, probably under two seconds. Uh, but then 100 to 300 is also two seconds. So there's a carbon frame underneath this. And when we used um, the carbon frame without the top fairings, um, just a flat piece of carbon. It just went to 80 kilometers per hour. And then we added the canopies and we went 60 kph faster. And I think Shaggy was saying it kind of, when you launch it at low speeds, it handles like a normal drone, but then yeah. at a high speed, it just naturally yeah. becomes a missile. Yeah. Does that change how you steer it? Like when you're in? Definitely. Yeah. Well, if you then adjust your roll, which would be left to right, which normally would be yaw. Oh, right. on your left steer. Right, yeah, yeah. So because you angled so much, you now have to, like, the controls are a bit like this. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah? Yeah. So I hold it, touch it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Wow. You can see some electronics inside. Yeah. Cobble fiber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you now inspired to do something with this? <laughs> I mean, the rocket shape's kind of cool. <laughs> Now, 
simply beating an F1 car in a drag race with a drone isn't actually that hard. But that isn't what's special about this. It's the fact that it can follow an F1 car for an entire lap without running out of batteries or catching on fire from overheating. I'm excited to see what Red Bull tries next, and I can only hope that someday Hacksmith Industries can push limits like this too. But for now, I'm going to keep exploring new places, new technologies, and following the bleeding edge of innovation. If you have ideas of stories or places for me to visit, please shoot me an email at travel at the hacksmith.com. And thank you for watching.